Thanks, Ben. Uh, so, my name's Rob Johnson. I work for Sony Interactive Entertainment. I'm the manager of the user research team who are based here in London. What I wanted to do with the short session we have just before lunch is talk to you a little bit about what we do, what the team do, what we test, and how we test it. What I'm going to start with is talking about who Sony Interactive Entertainment actually are. You probably know the PlayStation brand, but there's a whole lot more complicated things going on in the organization. Then I'm going to talk about how our team fits in with that, um, how we do our testing, we'll talk a little bit about our facility, where we do our testing, and then talk about what we do beyond just the games that PlayStation makes. So Sony Interactive Entertainment, as I said, is probably best known for the PlayStation brand. But the organization is actually split broadly into three main areas. We have the section that makes the hardware, and um, so you probably know things like the PlayStation 4, which was released a few years ago, and um, has gone on to sell over 60 million units so far. PlayStation VR, which was launched last year, and in itself has sold over a million units. From the services side, uh, you probably know PlayStation Plus, that's the most well-known. Um, and then the other side of the organiza organization is where we are. This is the part of the organization that makes the games. And it has a specific name, this is called Worldwide Studios. Um, together, all these parts of the organization form the games and network division of Sony. And it's actually a very profitable and a big part of Sony, so it's a really nice place to be if you're a user researcher. But let's have a look at the games then. That's really what we're focused on today, the games user research. So Worldwide Studios is actually a very literal name. It's a group of studios spread across the world, focused really in North America, Europe, and Japan. <coughs> You may recognize a couple of these logos from the different studio teams, but I think to get a good idea of who they are and what they make, let's have a little look at some of the more famous titles. So in North America, we have teams like Sucker Punch, who you probably know from Infamous. Uh, we have uh, Santa Monica Studio, who make the God of War series. We have Naughty Dog, just down the coast from them, who are famous for Uncharted, a hugely successful title, uh, which has sold over 46 million copies from their first game back on PlayStation 3. And then down in San Diego, we have uh, San Diego Studio, who are famous for the baseball game, The Show. Now, if we take a look over at the other side then, starting here in Europe, we have the imaginatively titled London Studio, based in London. Um, you may know them from SingStar, quite a popular franchise over the years, um, recently moved into VR titles to support PlayStation VR. We have Guerrilla Games, who really made their name with the Killzone series, um, back in the day, more recently have released Horizon Zero Dawn, which is an open-world action-adventure game that came out earlier this year. Back to the UK, we have Media Molecule, who are making dreams at the moment, but really kicked off things with the Little Big Planet franchise. And then over in Japan, probably the biggest studio there is Polyphony Digital, who made uh, probably our most successful uh, series of games, which is uh, Gran Turismo. Now, support, to support all these studios, we have four different user research teams um, across the globe. We have two in the US, one in San Mateo, one in San Diego, where the, um, the show team are based. We have one in Tokyo, and then there's us in London here. So what I want to do is talk about London. That's where we are today. That's the team I'm from. Um, so let's dig a little bit deeper into what we do. But we're responsible for all the studios throughout Europe and we test all the content that comes out of Europe. So this is the first party studios uh, I gave a, a brief introduction to just now, but also there's a number of second party studios as well who are making content exclusively for the PlayStation platforms. And between these two types of studios, and we have a whole range of different franchises and different games that we get to work on. And these range from quite small uh, multiplayer um, audience broadening games for families like Frantics through to big titles like Horizon, and narrative titles such as Detroit, the upcoming game from Quantic, uh, Quantic Dream in Paris. The team itself uh, is reasonably old as far as games user research teams go. It was formed uh, just under 10 years ago. Um, in that time, we've worked on over 100 different titles, not just from Europe. We do also occasionally work on titles coming from the US and Japan. Um, most notable ones are Bloodborne uh, from a, a little while ago, uh, Infamous Second Son we worked on as well. Uh, the teams like to keep us busy. We get through about 50 uh, rounds of testing every year, so it averages about, about one a week. Uh, we tend to get Christmas off, which is nice. Um, and that equates to about 1,000 um, consumers coming through our doors of our lab in London every single year. So there's a lot of people playing our games and giving us feedback. Now, something that's really changed, not just what the development teams are doing, but what we're doing as well, has been the introduction of PlayStation VR to the PlayStation environment. Uh, in Europe, there's been quite a few titles that have 
uh, developed to support the launch of PlayStation VR in October last year. And we started getting involved in those back in 2014 with some of the launch titles like PlayStation VR Worlds, Rush of Blood, and Rigs. And since we started working on uh, VR, there's been 10 different titles within Europe um, that have come through our test facility. And that's given us a really good understanding of all the different uh, and broad range of different experiences that, place, uh, that VR can bring, the challenges of making those and the challenges of, of testing those as well. And I'll talk about this a little bit more later. We don't just make software. We do get involved in the other side of the organization that makes the hardware, and we do run tests for them. So we look at uh, running ergonomics tests, on some of the physical devices like the PlayStation VR, the DualShock 4 controller, but we also look at the software system, the platform software as well, looking at the UI of the PlayStation 4 and the various apps on there. So let's talk about how we approach games user research. I think the best way to do this is to take a, an example of one of our, our games, and probably the biggest for Europe <coughs> over the last couple of years has been Horizon Zero Dawn. If we take a look at the timeline of when we were interacting with that game, you can see we spent quite a lot of time um, from our initial interaction with them back in August 2014 through to the release of, game, of the game in February this year and then the DLC which came out last month. So in that three year period we ran uh, 26 user tests and that's just in Europe. There are a number of tests also uh, taking place in that time in the US. Now early on, um, we approached the game in a, in a very, uh, we wanted to get a lot of details. So we approached it in a one-to-one -one way. Well, this means we had one user come in at a time, play through the game. We had quite short amounts of code which allowed us to do this. So we were typically spending an hour or two with users, looking at the core mechanics, making sure things were working, and really looking at how the users interacted with the game in detail. As time goes on and the game uh, went through development, more and more code was available. Running tests in this way just isn't practical. So we moved over to the typical multi-seat play test area. And here we were able to go through much, much larger amounts of code. Some of the tests with full playthroughs were taking up to 24 hours of gameplay into consideration. And for these, we brought users back over the space of a week uh, to play through. And here we can look at things like balancing and pacing of the game uh, and difficulty as users progress through the missions. Not everything we did with Horizon was based in our facility. We went over to Amsterdam and tested in the offices of the development team. And this worked best when we, had, uh, when we were using the right methodology, so rapid iterative testing and evaluation. Here, the team would build a very specific um, build of the game for us uh, to test one specific mechanic that had been causing problems um, during the previous test. And what we'd do is we'd set up very quick tests to go through a number of users in a morning, and then we'd work with the team in the afternoon to look at create, fixing those issues as best we could and creating a second iteration of the build. And what we'd normally do is work through that within a week, so we'd get through five different tests in a week. Um, and in that space of time, we were able to get to a, 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 the a mechanic into a much better situation. We were able to get through a lot of progress in a very short amount of time. And ultimately, we were able to achieve our goal that we have for every game that comes through uh, our, our team, which is to make sure we test everything in there multiple times. So that's how we approach games. I think that's a typical example of how we would approach a game that we test. Let's have a look at our research facility now. So we're actually probably the most local team around. We're just the other side of Oxford Circus um, is where we're based. And our lab is split broadly into two areas. Uh, we have the multi-seat game test area that you can see here, which has 10 seats for users to come in and play through games simultaneously. It's a fairly standard affair for, for a games user research facility. If we jump behind the one-way mirror, you can see what the researchers and the, those viewing the sessions um, get to see as players are playing through. So we'll take a feed from every single one of those seats. Um, we can take whatever we want, but typically it's the game feed. It's a feed of the user through a camera. We take the controller maps, and we can throw the questionnaires in there as well. You'll also see just at the top left of the picture one of the two large screens we have in the room, um, which we tend to use to multiplex all of the 10 game feeds together. So if you're not interested in one particular user, you can sit back and just look at all the 10 users at once. This is particularly good for the, the producers and developers who don't want to focus on one thing at a time. The other side of our facility is our one-to-one -one and social rooms. So here is where we test one person at a time or small groups of users. Again, if we jump behind the glass, we can see what's going on for the researchers and for those watching the sessions. And here the focus is less about 
watching as many people at once, but really about getting as many views of one user or a small group of users as we can. So we have multiple camera feeds, we have the game feed, we also have the ability to capture what's going on in any companion devices. So a lot of our games at the moment um, involve using a mobile phone as an input rather than a controller, and we can capture what's going on with those as well. What we have is the ability to change what we see and what we record on the fly as well. So we have a lot of flexibility in our system. So a typical setup will probably be just taking the game feed and taking a couple of camera shots from this social room. So we can see what's going on in the room, we can see what's going on in the game. But for those games which are using a companion device, that's actually, it's important. There's, there's stuff going on there, there's an app that people, that we need to know if people are using correctly. So we can switch that on the fly to see what's going on there, how are these users interacting with their app, and then still have a view of the game as well. Or perhaps the view of the game isn't so important, we just want to make sure we have a little bit of everything. We can switch it so we've got all the feeds coming in at any one time. And we can just adjust this to whatever we want to get from the test or whatever the development team want. And this works in the 10 seat as well. So this is the 10 multiplex view that I was talking about earlier. So it's a great way to get an overall sense of what's happening in the room. But if something interesting is happening and you want to zoom in on that user, we can do that. We can jump to that user, watch them playing their game in a much larger uh, screen. We can see that user as well. And we've also got the controller mapping that I mentioned earlier. So we can see this user here playing Wipeout using the left stick to steer the ship and R2 and L2 to use the air brakes. And we can see if they're using things at the right time and they're understanding the controls properly. Or maybe we don't care about the controller, but we've set them some specific tasks where we want to know where they're looking at and when they're looking at. And we can just overlay eye tracking data on top of the video. Or maybe they've finished playing and they're ready to start answering the questionnaire. Um, we can do that. We can switch over so we get a little preview of what the questionnaire data is going to tell us. Uh, obviously, they'll be ranking our games 10 out of 10. And we have, so we have a lot of flexibility in, in the lab. Uh, but the good thing is our, um, everything we've built to record uh, what's going on there is built on broadcast quality, uh, quality equipment. So it means we can broadcast this out to all the studios um, across the globe. And they get the same experience from their offices as they would get if they traveled to London. And here's a good example of that happening. This is the offices of Quantic Dream, the, the team who are making Detroit. And this is actually a test from just a couple of weeks ago where we were testing Detroit um, in our facility in London. And they stayed in their offices in Paris and watched the test live. And this is great for them because they save the time and the money required to travel to London. Um, but also, it means uh, because our system is, is all hardware based, what we can do is turn those live streams instantly into video assets as soon as the tests have happened. So it's good for these guys, but if, the, if you're not in the same time zone, which we see with the teams in Japan and in America, it means you don't have to be around when the tests are happening. You don't have to stay up till midnight to watch what we're doing in London. As soon as they're ready to come in and watch what we've, what's gone on, uh, they can do. Those recordings are available to them within seconds of the session ending. So let's talk a little bit about Beyond Games for the, for the final bit. So as we're part of a, a platform holder, PlayStation, we get to work on hardware and a platform UI as well. And I think, again, the best way to explain what we do here is talk about our most recent uh, hardware release, which was the PlayStation VR. Our PlayStation VR came out in October 2016, so it's just over a year old. We actually started getting involved with VR back in early 2013. So we were working with the hardware team in Tokyo to test the, um, the initial prototypes for PlayStation VR headset. Um, at this point, the PlayStation uh, well, the VR wasn't known, uh, it wasn't known that PlayStation was working on any VR uh, hardware. Um, so it was quite, uh, quite secretive and we were using internal members of staff from the various Sony buildings around our facility. If we jump forward to 2014, um, that's when the games started coming through and we started testing the VR games, but it's also when PlayStation VR was announced as Project Morpheus um, back at GDC that year. So this was great, we could start bringing members of the public in to, to test with the hardware. We were also able to take the hardware out to people's homes and we could see how the PlayStation VR headset um, worked in the real world. On to 2015, we continued researching. We started doing specific tests aimed at uh, children aged 13 and above to see how they coped with, with the hardware. Um, and then later on that year, we started looking at the physical packaging, so how users would receive the PlayStation VR um, in the coming months. And we looked at the out-of-box experience, how it was to unpackage your PlayStation VR and to set it up. And that involved also looking at the uh, paper manual that comes with the PlayStation VR package. 
Moving on to 2016 then, the year of launch, we started looking at the UI for PlayStation VR. This was predominantly for the demo disc, which comes with the PlayStation VR. And then it was also around that time that the competitors started releasing their VR headsets. So we looked at those in terms of their initial experience and outbox experience. And then finally, October 2016, PlayStation VR launches, and we run a diary study. So we grabbed 12 people who had pre-ordered the PlayStation VR, and they signed up to take part in a five-week diary study where we followed their initial use of PlayStation VR and the use over the subsequent weeks. Now, we were able to take the traditional um, uh, data that you get from a diary study, self-reporting, users were taking video and photos and sending, sending it to us, and we were able to interview them. But also, they agreed for us to take their PlayStation Network IDs and track them over that five-week period. So we were able to use business intelligence data and look at what games they were playing, when they were playing them, how long they were playing them, what time of day they were playing them, and cross-reference this with the qualitative feedback we were getting from the main part of the diary study. So it's really helped to give, give a real depth to the information we were gathering about how this product was being used. Uh, that's the end of my talk. Um, I'm afraid I do have an ulterior motive, which you've probably guessed by looking through the program, and that's we're, uh, that we're hiring. Um, so if there's anything I've mentioned today, uh, you think that looks interesting, I'd love to work a com for a company that does all those sorts of things, go and visit our um, jobs board, which is playstationjobs.co.uk. The website's also in the program, um, if you don't catch it just here. Um, if you search for games user researcher or user researcher, you're sure to find one of the jobs we've got. We've actually got three positions open, and we're recruiting across the board. So we're taking people at the junior level, um, who maybe don't have any industry experience, but have come out of university, through to more senior and principal levels as well. Uh, for any of you here who, who are still studying and not ready to look for work, uh, we do also have a student mailing list. And what we typically use this for is to get students in to help us run research projects. Um, so if you can travel to London or you're studying in London, it's a great opportunity for you to come in, get paid a little bit, um, but also get first-hand experience of what it's like to test games in a commercial environment. I encourage you to, to sign up there. Unfortunately, this is a brief session, and I'm sure you want to get to lunch, so I don't have any time for questions. But almost all of the research team are here today. Um, so if you see one of these friendly and approachable faces, come up and say hi. And uh, if you want to know more information about what we do, how we do it, or you want to come and speak to us about one of the opportunities, uh, please do. Thank you. <laughs>